Admittedly, I've been a lurker around these parts for several years now. I've tried to share this story numerous times, but I always struggle to wade through the pieces as they've gotten more and more jumbled and foggy with time. I can't say that I was traumatized by what happened. I'm not sure if that makes me a messed up person, but I typically tell this story at parties to manipulate drunk acquaintances into thinking I've survived something cool. Okay, let's get into it. In 2015, I was 19 years old and working for the summer at a Bible camp for inner city kids. I'm going to leave out the city name, but just know that obviously crime occurs frequently in big cities, and this one was no different. I had been assured that this neighborhood, however, was in the process of being gentrified, and they had even just opened up a hipster coffee shop slash dog park right down the street. Just to give you a really clear visual, this neighborhood had dilapidated houses with trash out in the front, right next to houses with immaculate yards and square modern architecture. The Bible camp where I was working was essentially just a huge two-story house with a large fenced-in yard. Again, we were assured that we were safe because we had bars on the windows and the outer doors locked automatically once they shut. The camp was conducted downstairs and the summer counselors, all four of us, lived in the small upstairs area that was off limits during the day to the kids. Our camp ran five days a week, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then time was ours to explore the city or rest or whatever we wanted. That's likely enough to get into the story now, although I love a good setting and it could be important for later. One weekend evening in July, we were all just hanging out in the house making a spaghetti dinner. We each got our own stipend for food, so we divided it accordingly for meals, then bought our own snacks. We were also in charge of preparing lunch and snacks for the kids on camp days, so we had two fridges and two pantries. As you can likely guess, we labeled them Camp Fridge Pantry, and one labeled as Staff Fridge Pantry. We also were super petty and wrote our names all over our snacks in the fridge. My best friend worked at the camp with me. We'll call her Chris. And it was our turn to cook that night. So I went into the staff fridge to grab the ground beef. I immediately notice that my case of Go-Gurts is gone. They were my go-to snack, and I bought like three cases a week. I had just opened my last box like an hour before to have one, and left it in front of the ground beef. It sounds crazy, but I knew I did. I close the fridge door and head out to the dining room, Chris closely behind me, where I yell at everyone else, who stole my go -Gurts? That night, in addition to Chris and myself, there were two other summer counselors, two permanent counselors that lived in the area, and then the cousin of one of the permanent counselors. Everyone in the room looked at me wide-eyed and blankly. I figured that it might have been the cousin because I had never met her before. So I just sucked it up and said, whatever, just if it has a name on it, please don't eat it. Then I pull Chris back into the kitchen to finish up the spaghetti. We all eat dinner and then the two permanent counselors volunteer to do the dishes because we let them eat with us. The rest of us head back upstairs to get comfy in the sitting room, on the couches and turn on Family Guy. We're only like two minutes in when the cousin, we'll call her Sarah, says, Wait, I can't find my phone or my wallet. I pause the show and roll my eyes still annoyed about the Gogurts. Chris says, Well, where did you last have them? Sarah says she left them on the couch before we went downstairs to dinner. Naturally, we all start looking around the small room, turning over couch cushions, looking behind the couches, under blankets, really wherever. Finally, we're like, are you sure you didn't leave them downstairs? She agreed to head downstairs to look with the other two, and Chris and I go into our room, which is connected to the sitting room. We flop down on the bottom of our bunk bed, and I proceed to talk shit about Sarah, who I feel is like ruining our chill night. Our door is open, and I'm shocked when I see a hand kind of sneak into view, like it's about to grab the doorframe. I say, hey, did you find them? 
thinking that Sarah or the other two have somehow made it back upstairs without me hearing them and have heard me talk sh for the past five minutes. But that's when the hand immediately disappears from the doorframe and there's no audible response. I look at Chris like, what the f And she's looking right back at me, confused, because she never saw the hand. I quickly explain what happened, and then we both jump up and head to the top of the stairs. We yell down for the others, and they yell back that they haven't found them yet. By this point, I'm freaked the f out, because who is up here with us? Of course, we're those people, though and we start looking around upstairs in our bedroom, the other bedroom, and in the sitting room. We find nothing and no body. We decide not to say anything yet because I might sound insane. And also, how could someone have gotten downstairs so fast without us hearing them? Eventually, when we head downstairs, Sarah is super upset and crying. Her cousin says, Come on, guys. Did someone take her stuff? but Chris and I both know we didn't, and we say so. Sarah screams that obviously someone took them, and we should just be honest, and that's when things get heated. I finally decide then to tell them about the hand because I feel like it will maybe reduce the tension between all of us. It does, but then it causes a panic. We run around the house like maniacs, looking in every closet or spot that we deem a hiding place. We end up calling our camp director to come over because the situation has just devolved into chaos. When he gets there, we're all huddled in the foyer, freaked out, and we explain all we can. He doesn't seem convinced that someone was in the house and threatens to call the cops if one of us doesn't give Sarah back her things. Well, none of us fess up, so he makes good on his promise, calls the cops, and they come over to search the property and take our statements. It seems so dumb as we repeat our stories, but we didn't have much to go off of. Just a feeling. They write a report for stolen property, and that at least makes Sarah feel a little bit better. With the house secure, everyone leaves except for us four summer counselors who live there. We spend the night in the same room, with the door barricaded, reassuring ourselves that we're being stupid and that the phone and wallet will actually turn up somewhere random, and we'll all have a good laugh about it. Fast forward a few days, we've relaxed a bit. We haven't found Sarah's things like we expected, but nothing else weird has happened, and we've been occupied with the kids and the job in general. The kids have all gone home at this point, and it's just the four of us again at the house. We finish cleaning up the outside, lock the gate, and head through the dining room door. We're all hungry and want our snacks. Chris gets to the kitchen first and says, Someone left the kitchen door open again. I mean, it's kind of weird, but kids go in and out that door all day. So of all the doors to be open, this one is the least weird. She shuts it, and then I notice that the staff fridge door is also cracked open. Then who knows what possessed me, but I go, Oh no, y'all. He's back. We all laugh because we think it's ridiculous, at least on the surface. Chris grabs a broom, holds it as a weapon, and says, Let's get him, girls. She starts to throw open the pantry door, screaming, Where the f*** are you, mother f***er? And we know you're in here. Show yourself. I'm following behind her laughing, but I start to inexplicably feel uneasy and nervous. She continues her charade into the next room, throwing open two more closet doors. Then she moves into the front room and opens that closet door. She starts another confident, We know you're... When she stops mid-sentence and screams so loudly, the skin on my neck prickles. Then she throws the broom into the closet and sprints out the front door, leaving it open. My heart is pounding out of my chest at this point, but I think she's messing with us. So I turn around and go the other way into the foyer and out the front door. I see her booking it down the street. And I'm like, okay, what is she doing? But as soon as I turn back around to find the others, he's just there. An older man looks really dirty, has hardly any teeth. 
but he's grinning at me. He has his hands up and says, I didn't mean no harm, while slowly backing away down the front steps in the opposite direction of the way that Chris ran off. It's so creepy because even though he says this, it's like he doesn't mean it. It's like his tone and the grin are meant to mock me. I'm frozen for a second. I sputter out. Where are you going? It's not like you can leave now. That's when he just says again with that goddamn grin. I didn't mean no harm. Before turning off and running. I fumble around in my pocket for my phone and dial 911. Then I go to follow him. But as soon as I reach the edge of the house, he's gone. The next events are kind of a blur. And it sounds wild, but we all really thought we just freaked ourselves out. No way in hell did we actually think someone was in the house. The cops took our statements and reminded us that we needed to keep the door shut at all times no matter what. Our director apologized profusely for not initially believing us. My parents wanted me to come back home for the remainder of summer, but I was like, eh, what else could happen? Chris was the one who had it the worst. She was terrified to stay in that house. She told me later that the first thing she saw when she opened that door was that man's toothless grin. Like, he was just waiting for her to finally find him. She said that she'll never forget his face. We're still best friends at almost 30 years old, and I can't bring up that summer to her if she hasn't been drinking. I think what kept me up at night afterwards were just unanswered questions. Like, how long had he been in the house? Why did he randomly decide to take the phone and wallet of the one person who didn't work there? Had he listened to our private conversations? Watched us get dressed and shower? How much food had he stolen that we didn't notice? Where the f*** had he gone when we were looking for him on spaghetti night? What hiding places did we miss? Was he under my bed at night? Or at any point during my stay? I don't have any of these answers. And I know that I'll never get them. But I'm thankful that our interaction wasn't worse, I guess. I'm feeling particularly scared right now and could use a little advice. A few months ago, this guy started showing up at my favorite coffee shop. At first, he seemed nice enough. We had a few casual conversations, but it ended up being clear that he was interested in much more than just being friends. He asked me out a couple of times, and each time, I politely declined. I even mentioned that I had a girlfriend, hoping that he'd get the hint. My girlfriend and I have been together for three years, and we're really happy together. I thought the guy would respect that. But instead, things took a turn for the worse. After I rejected him for the third time, I started noticing him everywhere. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence. Maybe we just like the same places. But then it got weird. He'd be at the grocery store when I was shopping, at the park when my girlfriend and I were taking a walk, and even outside of my apartment building. I did my best to just brush it off as paranoia. But a few weeks ago, my girlfriend and I were at the park. It was a beautiful day out, and we were enjoying each other's company and the sunshine. When I saw the same guy off in the distance, my heart immediately sank. I tried to ignore him, and ultimately he didn't approach us, so I felt like that was a win. But that night, I got a message on Instagram from an obviously fake account. It was a video of us at the park with a creepy message attached that read, cute couple, shame that one of you is with the wrong person. Both me and my girlfriend were freaked out by this. I reported the account and blocked it, but videos kept coming. Different accounts, different angles. Since then, I've stopped going out as much, and when I do, I can't shake the feeling that I'm being watched. My girlfriend tries to be strong for the both of us, but I can tell she's scared too. We've talked about moving or calling the police, but we're both unsure about what the next step should be. Has anyone else dealt with something like this? 
How did you handle it? Any advice on what we should do next? I just, I just want to feel safe again. One commenter shared, Save screenshots every time he sends you messages. You need evidence of him constantly contacting you and the harassment. Tell people at your job, just in case he figures out where you work. Get cameras and a ring doorbell, in case he finds out exactly where you live. That way you have evidence of that too. The fact that he's found your Instagram without you giving it to him is very worrying and shows he's willing to put in a lot of effort to get to you. Look up stalking laws where you live as well. Some places have different rules they abide by when handling cases like these. Good luck. The year was 2007, and I was 13 at the time. The new SmackDown vs. Raw WWE game had just come out, and I walked into my small town on a Sunday morning to purchase it. After getting the game, I was in awe of the cover and the synopsis on the back of the game, so I sat on a bench to read it and revel in the excitement of buying a new game. I lived in a very small market town in England, so Sundays were often quite quiet. While sitting on the bench, I looked over to the nearest bus stop across the road and noticed a strange scraggly man walking towards me. I was a bit nervous seeing this because although I was a teenager, I looked as if I was about 11. I was quite small. On his approach, the man called out to me and asked what it was that I was holding. I explained that it was my new game. He, seeming enamored by my response, reached out and asked to see the game. Instinctively, I recoiled more than just a bit. I stood up from the bench and said, I need to go. My brother is waiting for me at the mall. And although he wasn't, I felt like I needed to say this. As I walked off, the man began to follow me, asking me questions like my name and my age. I replied with a fake name and told him my age. On entering the mall, I started walking quicker and quicker, trying to put some distance between me and this man. But I didn't want to flat out run, as for some reason, I wanted to save face. He kept asking me questions, like if I had a girlfriend. And as he got closer at times, I noticed he had a giant scar on his face, along with lots of jewelry on. To his question, I responded yes, as I thought that it may put him off if he knew that I had a girlfriend. I then scampered into a shop and started flicking through the magazines, but this man persisted. He found which aisle I was in and continued with the questions. At this point, I got up the courage to just run, run as fast as I could. As I made it out of the mall, I saw that this man was in pursuit. Given how scraggly and worn down he looked against my fresh legs, he had no chance of catching me. Once I got home, I didn't tell my parents what I had just gone through. I went upstairs, played my game. But later that day, I did tell my mom, and she contacted the police immediately. I then had to go to the police station, tell them what had happened, and try to pick this man out of a number of photos that the police had on a laptop. I didn't have to scroll for very long. On the second or third page of People, I saw that man easily identifiable with the scar and all. Apparently, he was well known by the police in our town and the major city down the road. This man had a long history with the law and, more strikingly, had a penchant for snatching up young boys. Not long after my encounter with him, he was found and arrested on the suspicion of multiple crimes. These included kidnapping, endangering a minor, in several accounts of assault. All told, he got eight years. My account of what had happened was not enough to have all these charges levied against him. It took a few of his previous victims to come forward and give their own accounts of what horrible things had happened to them. 
they all more or less mirrored my encounter. The man had approached them when they were out, alone, and distracted. More often than not, it was brute force that he employed, not charm or cunning. I'm grown now, but I still think back, and it breaks my heart to know what those other young men had to endure at this guy's hands. There are days where I feel both guilty and lucky that I got away and made it home to play video games that day. In my mind, eight years locked up is hardly suitable for what that man did, but that's what he got. And I only pray that every day he spent behind bars were miserable and filled with the same type of pain that he inflicted on many young children. 